Good morning, Brookside Church. My name is Wes Mulbash. I'm the communications director here. Happy Easter. It's a glorious day. It's weird. This is probably the, this is, this is the first Easter that I can remember that the church isn't here, that the church isn't packed out, that we're not uh, all flipping out, trying to figure out where to park people. And honestly, those are things you're kind of looking forward to. The, the energy of Easter morning is, is, uh, is not here. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're not going to bring our A game. We're going to have a great time this morning. We're going to celebrate our risen Savior. It is a day to celebrate, regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of what you see on the news, regardless of any fear you might have or uh, whatever is going on, we can set that aside for just a little bit right now and focus on the truth that God is in control, that his uh, son lives, that Jesus is here, and uh, we have hope. We have nothing but hope. And I think that is the thing that I think about, uh, especially as we're going through this season right now with the quarantine and everything, I'm so thankful for my faith. I'm so thankful for Jesus Christ and what he did for me. And, and I'm so thankful that uh, even when things are, you know, you get cabin fever and you just want to get out and then just your entire, our routines are all messed up right now. But uh, my faith is secure and I know that, uh, that everything is going to be okay in the long run because my faith is in Jesus Christ. And I hope that you have that peace right now too. And we're going to celebrate that peace today. It's going to be a great day. We're glad you're here. And uh, we're glad you're joining us. And uh, I do want to take some time now to invite my good friend, my esteemed colleague, uh, Rachel Elliott. She's a graduate of Ohio Christian University. And uh, she wants to give a little shout out to our Brookside kids. Good morning, kids. It's so good to see you. I'm sorry that you're way far away in, in your own homes, but glad to be with you on this beautiful Easter morning. What an exciting time we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And you know what? There's a song that's been on my mind, and I think we're actually going to sing it later today. And It's Because He Lives, and I'm not going to sing it for you because you guys know that I cannot do that. But I thought about the words to that, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And what an exciting thing that is, that because he lives, we can, no matter what's going on, we can face tomorrow. Tomorrow. And so I'm super excited about that and excited to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Um, I want to remind you, I totally forgot to tell you guys, um, to remind you about the sketch notes last week. Um, so I want to remind you today when Ms. Pastor Ryan is doing his message to do those sketch notes. A couple weeks ago, you guys um, submitted some awesome sketch notes and it was such, such fun to see um, what you got out of the sermon. And so we want you to do that again today. Kind of sketch out your notes and send them to us um, on our Facebook page or you can email them to me. Um, but just excited to be here with you guys this morning. I hope you have a great time with your families today. Good morning, Brookside youth, and happy Easter to you. Hope that you guys are well uh, today. You know there's a difference between uh, a command and a suggestion. A command is like, the house is burning, you should get out. That's a command. A suggestion is more like, well, you shouldn't bite your toenails in public. Don't do stuff like that. And we need wisdom to know which is which, and we look to that. You know, uh, the, book of, uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So what do you think? Command or suggestion? Man, God sounds pretty emphatic when he says that, to encourage one another. And yet sometimes I think we take that as a suggestion, as if, ah, I'll get, I'll get around to that. I'll, I'll, I'll do that later. I think that that is a command, and you know the statistics don't don't say very good things about teenagers that they're struggling with discouragement, especially during these times. And so I want to encourage you, Brookside youth, to send a note to connect on social media and encourage one another. It's not like you're going to get in trouble for over encouraging. So if somebody comes up to you and says, "Wow, you're being too encouraging." they probably need some encouragement themselves, right? So encourage one another. Send a note. Uh, do something like that. I'm going to put a devotional out there uh, this week, as I normally do. You guys can go through that on, uh, on Wednesday. Other than that, let me pray for you. Father, just uh, pray for our young people. Pray that they would be encouraging to one another. In your name, amen. I would like to encourage all of us to get ready to go to prayer together this morning. And uh, happy Easter. This is one of my favorite days. 
favorite uh, uh, events in the calendar of the church, and and uh, we're just delighted that you are with us today and sharing this great day with us. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We have much to celebrate today. Uh, the tomb is empty. Nothing stopped this event from coming. We are here today, uh, whether it's virtual or however we're able to gather together. Thank God for his incredible presence. Thank God for the hope that we have because he is alive, he is well, and uh, we have the opportunity to be those who can share that message to the world and, and just delighted to do that. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you today with hearts that are so thankful, so full today of the reality of the fact that the tomb is empty, the living Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is making intercession for every single one of us this morning. And we're so thankful for that. Many of us have been praying for people that we know that have been stricken by this uh, illness. And, and we, we know of people that um, are going through difficult times. But God, this morning, we are so thankful that you are going to meet every need according to your riches in Christ Jesus, as Paul told us. And so today, it's with that confidence, that confidence that we come to you, knowing that whatever our hearts are burdened with today, you hear us, you see us, as we have been in this series this whole uh, month as we were preparing for Easter and coming up to this day. You do see us today, Lord. You know where we are. And so I pray for that one who is struggling physically. I pray for that one who is emotionally challenged this morning with all of the cares of life that just seem to be pressing in. Lord, we know today that we have not only a hope, but we have the assurance of knowing exactly what our future looks like because you've clearly told us in, our, in your word that we will someday be with you for all eternity. And so, Lord, we, we just pray today that as we, as we worship you, as we, as we celebrate the risen Lord today, you, our risen Lord, as we celebrate that, I just pray today that you will fill every home right now with the incredible presence of the Holy Spirit. May God's Spirit just fall on us as we worship together. And Lord, we just thank you today that we know that you see the end. And when we are all able to gather back together in this building again, we want to be faithful in the meantime. But now let us praise you with everything that is within us. For we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise that you deserve today. For it's in the eternal name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Brookside Church family. We miss you so much in this building. But you know what? He is risen. He is risen indeed. And no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we can celebrate that like we were all together. So let's do that this morning and let's worship him and let's sing about that resurrection and what he did for us. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all names who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king
this morning. This is amazing grace. <laughs> this is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. for me and worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain and worthy what he's done for you I sure do hope you are I sure do we know in Romans chapter 6 verses 9 and 10 it says this that we know that when Jesus was raised from the dead it was a signal of the end of death death as the end and never again will death have the last word when Jesus died he took sin down with him but alive, he brings God to us. And that's what we celebrate this morning. I love Max Lucado's writing, and one quote that I love especially, as we're thinking about the cross and we're thinking about the resurrection and what he did for us, it says, nails did not hold the Lord to the cross, love did. The sinless one took on the face of a sinner. So we sinners could take on the face of a saint. So today, the one who knew no sin became sin for us, and we celebrate the resurrection. He became sin who knew no sin, that we may become his righteousness. Humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Yeah. Jesus Messiah. Name above all. And 
the veil was torn Love so amazing Love so amazing Jesus Messiah Name above all names Blessed Christ 
Good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. As uh, we continue in our heart of worship, we'd like to invite you, uh, wherever you are, to continue uh, to give uh, and tithe unto the Lord. Uh, there are two ways that you can give here at Brookside. Uh, you can give online by going to brooksidechurch.com slash give, and you can do that, and it's an easier way to do it. Or you can write a check, and by the mail, you can send that in. You mail it to Brookside Church, 2215 Egypt Pike, Chillicothe, Ohio, 45601. And that's a way that you can continue to give. And um, the, we're going to pray right now as the, the Lord would take these tithes and offerings as we continue to give with a joyful heart and an attitude of worship right now. So would you please pray with me right where you are. Heavenly Father, we do thank you on this Easter Sunday that you are Lord, that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that you are the Lord. So, Father, right now we ask that as these tithes and offerings come in, Lord, that you would use them for the work of your kingdom so that your gospel, the good news, will be proclaimed and people will have hope in you. So, Father, we just thank you for this, this beautiful morning, this Easter morning. So we pray that you bless us, bless this tithe, and, uh, Lord, we, just, we love you and praise you. It's in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. As we were preparing for this Sunday, we uh, normally at this point in the service would have the choir come and sing a special song before Pastor Ryan brings his message. So we thought we would just go back and uh, use a song that the choir did last year. So this is from April 2019 from the Easter service. And uh, this is one way we could have all of you with us today. So enjoy.
difference a few weeks make, right? It wasn't long ago that our staff had gathered together and uh, talked about, tried to figure out how we were possibly going to squeeze everybody into this room. Um, How would we ever get everybody into the parking lot on Easter Sunday? Uh, Today there's plenty of space. Uh, There's lots of room that we have. It's not a problem today, but never did any of us imagine that we would be here in an empty room on this holiest of days. Never did I imagine I wouldn't be rewarded for my Easter suit by a big hug from Mrs. Bonnie Norman. It's one of my favorite parts about Easter. She loves when I dress up. Um, Never did we imagine any of these things, that that we wouldn't be allowed to go anywhere. 
Um, it was such a difference it was last year. Last year at this time, my family was just starting to look ahead and look forward to our big summer trip. Uh, just a couple months after Easter of 2019, the Bashes were headed to Canada. I was very excited about this trip. I had not been to Canada since I was about seven years old. Uh, my family, the rest of my family, had never crossed our northern border. And so we were really pumped up. The culture, the land, the maple syrup, we were just going to soak it all in. Um, in every way we could. And so our plan was to stop for a little bit at Niagara Falls just a day, and then we we're going to go a few more hours further into Ontario um, to check everything out and take it on. But it was rather, instead of all those things, I thought it would be cool to see the falls, and it was. Um, but it was actually an unexpected sight that we saw on our trip that ended up marking the experience for all of us. Now, we did not know this going in. Maybe you knew this. Uh, but the Canadian school year goes a little bit further into the summer than what it does in the States. And so, um, it, so when we went, we went right after our kids got out of school, which was before their kids got out of school. And so what that meant was that when we went there, um, it, we, we were going at kind of what, would, what you'd consider a national downtime, I guess. There just wasn't a lot going on. So where we were, skiing was very popular, but it was not cold enough for that. Um, the summertime activities in Canada just weren't kicked up yet because families weren't available, and so there just wasn't that much to do. And we weren't sure how to spend our time, how to occupy ourselves. So we went there right down the street from where we stayed. We, there was a place where there was all kinds of hiking trails, and it was a really cool area. And so we thought, that sounds like a good, healthy, wholesome family activity. That's what we'll do. We'll go hiking. And so we went. We got in our van. We went down the road, and we pulled into the lot. And right as we pulled in, there was a guy in the parking lot. There was almost nobody else in the parking lot, just another car or two. And right as we pulled in, um, he was standing there, and he had just got done with a bike ride, and it looked like he was changing his clothes. And so when we pulled in, um, our van pulls this way, and I'm here, Chrissy's here, uh, Cameron is behind her, Cooper's behind me, and then Kaylin is, or excuse me, yeah, Kaylin's all the way in the back. And so we pull in this way, and as we pull in, I look across my wife, and I see this guy isn't wearing a shirt. And so I made comment, and something like, well, I guess he couldn't find a locker room or something like that. And as soon as I said that, a couple seconds go by, and I hear my wife scream out, he's naked! And I said, what? And she goes, he's naked. And, and I said, you mean shirtless? And I hear Cameron then go, no, he's naked. Oh my gosh. And he goes, Kaylin, put your head down, put your head down, Kaylin. And then Cooper from her seat just gets this big grin on her face and she just goes, naked. And I said, stop, everybody stop saying naked. Why is everybody saying this? I don't know what to do. And I'm thinking, well, should we sing? You know, just close your eyes. What a friend we have in Jesus. Why can't he find underwear? You know, we're trying to find something to sing. And so fortunately, by the time we stop in our spot, the guy had finished what he's doing. Um, but it was one of the most shocking things we had ever seen. And so it obviously dominated the conversation for the whole hike. But listen, here's what I started thinking. I've never been to Canada before. And so then I thought, well, well, maybe this is normal here. Maybe this is what you do when you take a bike ride in Canada, then you get naked in public. And so I started to wonder that, and I thought, I don't know this. I've never been here. I don't want to judge our neighbors to the north. And so I thought, maybe this is normal. I'm in their arena right now, and so I'll just try and figure that out. And so I figured, maybe I'll ask somebody. I'll just ask a Canadian, is it normal to get naked after a bike ride just out in public anywhere? And so later that afternoon... Uh, Kaylin and I were at a class where we learned how to make duct tape purses, um, which is a story that probably requires explanation on its own, but just for now, just let it go and recognize that our, our activities were limited. There just wasn't a whole lot to do. So we're making purses out of duct tape, and the girl who's teaching us, she's from Canada, and so uh, she had grown up there her whole life, and I said, hey, can I ask you something? She said, sure. What is it? I said, well, I went hiking today, and there at the bottom of the trail, there was a guy who just got done um, riding his bike, and he just changed right there. He just got totally naked right there in the parking lot. And I'm from Ohio, and we don't do that there, um, but maybe, I thought, well, maybe in Canada, you guys do that. So I just wondered, is that a thing? And she just looked at me like anybody would look at me if you asked that same question in your town in the States, and she goes, why would, she goes, no, that's not that's not normal at all. 
People don't get naked in Canada, out in public. And I said, well, that's one, I'm so glad to hear that because it shocked us, right? And now it's hard to unsee. And then, right as I was part way through that story, I thought, what a great day for Pastor Rachel to ask our kids to do sketch notes. Um, so bear in mind, kids, I'm talking to you now, kids, um, use your best judgment. There'll be plenty of other illustrations as we go forward. But it was one of those things that became sort of hard to unsee. But I, as I said, the conversation with this girl really helped because then I knew it's not just us. I mean, you would notice that too, right? If this sort of thing happened in front of you, you'd notice it and you'd remember it. Remember when something that unexpected, when something that shocking out of the ordinary happens right in front of you, you'd see it. But this morning, I'm going to tell you a story about the first Easter when a person didn't see something shocking, something out of the ordinary. I want to share with you about a woman who encountered the most remarkable scene in the history of the universe happening right in front of her. And as she did not see it, at least at first, follow along with me. This is from John chapter 20, starting in verse 10. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Now, I want you to imagine your mentor, your rescuer, your deep and personal friend has been executed right in front of your eyes just days ago. You watched it happen. You saw this take place. Then a few days later, that same person is standing right in front of you alive. Imagine if that happened to you, that whoever this person was for you, imagine this happens, and you're looking at this person live. The trauma of that, the pain of that, uh, everything about it would be on your mind. You would not be able to think about anything else, and yet now this person is standing next to you. How do you not see? For thousands of years, people have probably read this story and looked at Mary and said, how could you not? He's right in front of you. How could you not see that it was Jesus? Maybe it's for the same basic reasons that some of us still don't see. That some of us still don't know that it's Jesus and don't notice him. See, some of us, like Mary, are so caught up in the form of religion that we look right past the risen and living Lord. See, when Mark tells this story in his gospel, when he describes this moment, he points out that Mary and a few other ladies had initially brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus. Right? When she discovers that he's missing, then she goes and gets the disciples so that they can see the same thing. Right? And, and she's upset. She stands there crying, and the, the inference is that she's just trying to get closure of some sort that she wants to have this healing. When this sort of thing happens, you need to have it end. You need to have something wrapped around it. You need to have closure. And so she's seeking this sort of thing as she anoints the body. And this is what their customs dictated. And so she was so consumed with what she felt like needed to be done when she sees the gardener, who she assumes is the gardener, she makes this preposterous statement. She says, where have you put him? If you tell me where you put him, I'll go get him. Now you read that and you go, well, how? You're going to drag a dead body clear back here? But in her mind, it just, that's the thing she thinks that needs to be done because that is the custom to take care of this body. Sometimes we likewise think that we're serving the memory, serving the commands of Jesus. But in truth, we're looking right past him, Jesus himself. Others of us don't notice Jesus because we're so caught up in the things of the world. Now, I don't, I don't want to vilify Mary here, obviously. She was clearly passionate about doing right by Jesus. 
But there's something, in some ways, or a response is reflective to some of the things that we do and we say and we see here in the world. When we cannot see past our own problems, here's Jesus holding the answer because what's she looking for? She says, where's the body? And now Jesus in the flesh is standing in front of her. And he's offering the answer that she needs. And all she can think of is that which brings death. All she can consume herself with is other things that aren't him, that aren't him in the moment. And he's saying, look, I have this for you. And he likewise speaks to us, inviting us to take our eyes off of our problems, off of our own solutions, off of our worries, off of our sins. Listen, believers and non-believers alike, we can look at this passage on Easter Sunday and we go, Mary, how could you possibly not see Jesus. And yet I would ask the question, well, how could we? How could we miss him? How could we act like we're doing right by him, but not recognize his voice? How could we wallow in sin and despair and yet not recognize the one who holds out the hope and holds out the answer and healing and a way out for everything that we seek? Do you see me? We've been asking this question for several weeks now right, about the invisible people in this world, those who everybody else looks past, the outcast, the inconvenient, the hopeless, the insignificant. We talked one week about seeing the whole person. Pastor Ben talked last week about seeing the sinner. Do we see people as Jesus sees them? Are we opening our eyes to the people that most everyone else looks past? that everyone else ignores. And so far, we've been asking that question from their voice, from the voice of the invisible. Do you see me? But today, on Easter Sunday, I want to turn that question around, and I want to invite you to hear it from the voice of Jesus himself. Do you see me? Imagine our Lord standing before you asking that question. Do you see me? I know you celebrate me. I know you pray to me. I know you talk about me. I know you sing to me and sing about me. I know you serve me. I know you do all of these things. But do you actually see me? Do you notice me in the midst of Christian activity? Do you notice me in the midst of your pain and your struggle and the worldly pursuits and concerns? So as we walk through this passage that I started to read you this morning, I want to invite you to see two things. One, who is this Jesus that we're supposed to see? And secondly, what does it mean? What does it look like to open your eyes and actually see him? So who is this risen Lord we proclaim today? Who is Jesus? The first thing that Mary teaches us that we get from her model that she discovers is that Jesus is the one who is with me when I'm not yet even looking for him. Jesus is the one who's with me when I'm not yet even looking for him. For most of us, our experience tells us that if somebody is with you when you're not looking for them, that's a bad thing. Usually that means you got caught doing something. If somebody's with you and seeing you when you're not looking for them. Right? I'm not afraid to tell you, um, especially because the room's mostly empty, it's much easier to confess when the room is mostly empty. But I am quite partial to all the little candies that Jody Witten puts out on her desk. I walk by that desk almost every day, and there's a little bowl full of candies that look like they're just for me, that they were made for me. And so when I walk by, I like to take some. And listen, she knows about it. They're for public consumption. I'm not trying to hide anything, but I don't want to flaunt it. You know, I don't want to be there and do it all at once. I don't want to be like my kids at Longhorn on the way out where they just take a big handful and stuff them in their pockets. I try to do it discreetly. I try to take one or two at a time and, and just, you know, before people get there or after people leave, something like that. Um, But what I found is that in Brookside Church, there's nowhere you can go outside the eyes of the all-seeing cameras. (laughs) There are cameras everywhere, and so what kept happening to me is on Sunday morning, I'd go in, and I'd get myself a mint or two, and then I'd get a text from her husband, Harlan, telling me he was watching me take his wife's candy off of her desk. Every time I snuck a candy, he was watching me, right? He's there when I'm not looking for him. Usually that's a bad thing, but what a comfort it is when the same thing is said about Jesus, our rescuer. For so much of my life, I kept understanding the Lord as the one who was distant from me, who's, who's somewhat aloof and who's waiting for me to fail, and he'll love me sort of because he has to until I mess up, and then he won't want anything to do with me. He'll begrudgingly accept me until I give him enough reason to not, until I mess up again. But do you know that the actual Bible tells the opposite story. 
It tells us that the opposite is true of him. Even while we're scrambling around, even when I'm not looking for him or just outright rejecting him or even trying to please him, but not seeing him, he's there. He's waiting on me, inviting me to discover. Did you catch what he said to Mary? He said, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Do you ever wonder what his face looked like when he asked that question? And she's standing six feet from him, perhaps, saying, look, who are you looking for, Mary? And she looks at him but doesn't see him. But he's asking that invitation. He's saying, look, is your life not going how you hoped? Tell me about it. Are you trying to serve someone? Who is it? And so her eyes are flooded with tears. Her mind is just racing, right? She's broken and she's consumed, feeling totally and thoroughly lost without Jesus. And yet here he is right beside her the whole time, gently calling her, inviting her attention. So right, who is this Jesus? He's the one who's with us before we're looking. And yet notice that it wasn't even his initial question that opened her eyes. It was something simpler than that, something more personal. She said, please, sir, Tell me where he is, and I'll get him. And now watch this, John 20, verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Who is Jesus? Not only is he the one who's present and waiting and calling and comforting, but the second thing that Mary sees here, and the second thing that she discovers is that Jesus knows my name. Jesus is the one who knows my name. You know, I read a study the other day that said when a person hears their own name, that there is a unique brain activity that occurs, right? That something different in your mind, in your brain happens chemically when you hear your own name. What they said, they said this, um, that hearing your own name causes your brain to react as if you're engaging in the behaviors and thought patterns that serve as some of your core identity and personality markers. So when you hear your name, it's as if you're doing something that is so central to who you are that that same sort of activation happens. They went on to say that even some people, to some extent, for a person who is in a persistent vegetative state, that something sparks in their mind when they hear their own name. So a person who cannot interact, who cannot talk, who cannot notice or pay attention to the people around, sometimes who cannot even open their eyes, still have something spark, even for just a moment, when they hear their name at the sound of their own name. Now, anecdotally, all of us know that it means a lot, right? When you hear somebody who's important, um, say your name and know your name. If you find out that somebody who's important knows who you are, it's this boost. It's this feeling that you can't describe. I remember when I was young um, in, in junior high, I really wanted to play basketball for my school. Um, that's what I wanted more than anything. Now, I've probably told you before, I got cut from the eighth grade team. It was very sad for me. But all the, those couple years in junior high, um, every day, we would have, after lunch, we would go into this gym, and the varsity basketball coach, Coach Riggs, he would come in, and he would sort of oversee us playing basketball, just pickup game. Now, at that time, um, there was a standout at the University of Kentucky, right, named Jamal Mashburn, was a player who was really good at that time. Jamal Mashburn. And so I remember being in, in seventh or eighth grade and we were playing pickup ball and Coach Riggs is watching us. And I was taking shots and missing shots, you know, like I normally did. Uh, but there came a point where I made a shot and from the side and behind me, I heard Coach Riggs shout out, Jamal Bashburn. And he yelled it out, giving me this new nickname for my success. And I heard him yell that. And it was the first time I realized, man, this guy knows who I am. And I was so excited when I heard him yell that. Now, of course, in high school, I finally did make the team, and I heard him yell my name many, many more times. It was infinitely less exciting and of a much different nature when he would yell at me. But when it happened to Mary, look, when it happened to Mary, it wasn't just brain activity when she heard her name. It wasn't just these warm feelings. Jesus speaking her name as he likely had so many times before literally opened her eyes. When he said Mary, something happened in her where she went from seeing this person, this figure, as some sort of random gardener to knowing that it was him. 
He's here for me. He's with me. He knows me. And what I'm saying this morning is that the same thing is true for you. He's not just around, but he knows who you are. Even when other people don't. Even sometimes to some extent when you don't know who you are. He does. He knows everything about you, the good and the bad, and yet he still remains. Again, we're asking the question, who is this Jesus that we're supposed to be seeing? He's the one who's with us when we're not even looking for him, right? He's the one who knows my name. And finally this, Jesus is the one who invites me to trust. When Mary hears her name, she calls out Ramoni. What must have happened then is that she fell on him in some way. Either she fell at her feet. We've seen that over and over with Jesus. So either she fell at his feet or she just went into him for a hug or she grabbed onto him in some way. Because here's what he said in verse 17. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went uh, to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. When Jesus said, don't hold on to me, I always used to hear that. When I used to read that, I used to hear it as some sort of, um, don't, don't take me, don't soil me, don't besmirch me before I ascend. It was something like, I haven't gone to the Father yet, so <clears throat> excuse me, don't touch me yet. Sort of like that sort of thing. And I didn't get it. Um, I didn't get why that was important, that, that he couldn't be touched before he went to the Father. But, I, you know, it's like it when in Canada, right? You just, you just don't judge. Who am I to judge? But what I later discovered is that he wasn't saying to her, ooh, get off. He wasn't saying to her, don't touch me in that way. What he's saying is, Mary, there's no need to detain me because I haven't left yet. In other words, what he's saying is, Mary, you don't have to hold on to me. You don't have to grip me like I'm going to go away. He said, because I, I haven't gone yet. I'm going to ascend to the Father, but it hasn't happened yet. I'm still here with you. Now, look, in, in some ways, when Mary hears this instruction from Jesus, um, he just rose from the dead right? He, he's trustworthy if anybody in history ever was. So you'd listen to a guy like that. But think about it from her perspective. Imagine that you lost somebody you love. Imagine that the most important person to you in the whole world had just died. Imagine the emotion that you would be going through. And then all of a sudden, in a couple of days, you had them back in your arms. If that were me, I would be clinging, going, I'm never letting you go. I lost you once. I'm not going to lose you again. But he's saying, Mary, trust me. You, you don't have to hold on to me right now. You'll see me again. When he says, trust me, notice, though, it doesn't end there. The invitation is twofold. One, he's saying, Mary, I need you to trust that I'm not abandoning you. It's okay. You can let me go because I'm not going anywhere yet. Right? But two, the second thing he says, listen, I need you to trust me, and I want you to go and spread the news. And the reason that trust comes into the, the, is factored in is because what he's saying is, I want you to go tell people something they're not going to believe. I want you to go and inform people of something that they're going to think you're crazy, but I need you to trust me. Trust me when you can't understand. Trust me when you can't see the end. Trust, it means letting go and sharing the good news. Can you imagine the most shocking, remarkable, out of the ordinary occurrence happening right in front of you and yet not being able to see it? That's her story. Not even noticing that it was him. That's Mary at first. And I'm again saying to you sometimes, heaven help us, that is our story too. That he's right in front of us and we can't see him. We don't even notice that it's him. But Mary opened her eyes. He shows up. He speaks her name. He invites her to trust him. And all of a sudden, it's because of him that she can finally see. But how do we know? In other words, that's the other question we're looking at. Is how, if this is who it is that we're seeing, who is this Jesus? Well, how do we know Mary saw him? How do we know things turn around for her? I think her reaction shows us three things quickly. First, to see Jesus is to confess his name. The moment she sees him, she cries out, Rabboni. And John translates this as teacher. 
He says, when she shouts this out, what it means is he's telling all the readers. It means teacher. But in the strictest sense, it means literally, my dear Lord. She's not just saying here, when she cries out Rabboni, she's not just saying, Jesus, it's you. What she's saying is, you are my Lord. You're my teacher. You're the Lord and the teacher of me. And so remember, when you read James and he says, if you recognize universally speaking that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Lord, well, then you've only put yourself on the same level as demons. That's what James says in his letter, right? If, if that's all you're saying, then, then there's nothing unique about that. You're just putting yourself on the same level as all the spirits of hell. They, they all know and understand who he is. But Mary's saying something different than that. She's saying, no, no, you are mine. You are my teacher. She's putting herself in submission to him, saying, you have this authority over me. You are my master. You're the absolute master of every part of my life. So how do we know she sees him? First, she confesses. Right? The second thing she models for us is that to see him is to stay near to him. Remember, I shared with you when he says, don't hold on to me. I talked to you, about you or to you about what that meant from Jesus' perspective, what he meant by it. But think about it from Mary's for a moment. She has all these concerns when she's weeping at the tomb. I'm here to anoint the body. Oh, no, the body's missing. Boo-hoo, I don't know what to do. You, gardener, tell me where he is so I can go get the body. Now I'm going to need to drag a body. I probably can't do it, and it's going to make me unclean. She has all these concerns, but I'm going to do it anyway because that's what Jesus would have wanted. And then he speaks her name, and what happens? <laughs> all that stuff she was worried about, all of a sudden she falls at his feet and she clings to him. And what she's saying is, none of that matters now, I just want you. From Jesus' perspective, he has to correct it. Mary, you, you can, it's okay, you don't have to do this. But in Mary's heart, what's happening is she's saying, listen, all the stuff I was worried about, it doesn't matter to me anymore. I'm not going to go look for anything else. I'm just going to stay near to you. Whatever I have to do to cling to you and hold on to you, I'm not going anywhere. What's it mean to see him? It means to confess. It means to stay near. And finally this, she went to tell other people. If I'm going to see him, it means I confess him, I stay near, and I tell other people. And this is where I'm afraid that so many of us miss the memo on this, right? Because it's very true that Jesus loves me. We sing that song, right? Jesus loves me. But some of us are apt to forget that Jesus loves them too. Not just me, but all of us. It's not one or the other, it's both. And we live in a very individualistic society, right? Even before all of this that we're going through right now. Right? All this, this separation, it's been difficult for some. For others, um, this is your heyday. You're thinking, I can avoid people and not feel guilty about it? This is fantastic. Some of us are, are living this up right now. But even in a normal place, even in a normal setting, a lot of us distance ourselves from other people. Some of us don't even know who our neighbors are. There was a time in this nation where that would have been unheard of. But some of us don't even know the names of the people who live next door to us. And when that seeps into our faith, leading us to believe that all that matters is me and Jesus and my relationship with him, and if he and I are good, then everything's good. All we're doing is missing him. We're not seeing him. But to see him is to share him. When Jesus told her to go and tell the good news, look at what John says. It says, she tells them what she saw, and she tells them what he said. Here's what I've experienced with my eyes, and here's the message he wants all of you to know. It's as simple as that. And if I don't pour out what he's poured in, I'm afraid to say that we're simply not seeing Jesus. Do you see him today? In the midst of a national pandemic, in the midst of economic downturn, constant press conferences, anxiety, right, isolation, all of these things, do you see the one who has been with you the whole time? Do you see the one who's been with you while you were concerning yourself about all the problems and where am I going to get toilet paper and where am I going to get food and where am I going to get all these things? Do you see the one who has never left your side through all this? In the midst of grieving, in the midst of shame, in the midst of loneliness, overwhelmed by guilt because something in your past. 
Do you see the one who knows your name? Do you see the one who loves you even though he knows everything about you and that stuff that caused other people to want to reject you? Do you see the one who looks at you and says, I know who you are, and yet I'm still here, I'm still near. And when we're beset by uncertainty and huge decisions, doubt and fear about what's going to happen next and what you're going to do about it, do you really see the one who invites you to trust, who says, I want you to let go of all these things. I want you to let go of all your worries, and I want you to share my word, my message, and what you've seen in me. And whether it's sin or busyness or some obsession we have with our Christian duties, about the things we have to do. There's so much in this world that would seek to distract us and take us away from what it is that he wants to show us. It'd take us away and take our eyes away from the most remarkably shocking event in history. That God looked down on us. That he saw us. He saw our sin. He saw our brokenness. He saw our helplessness. And he sent his son to take on flesh, to become one of us, to die for us, to bear that burden and ultimately pay the price and then raise from the dead to show us that we too can live. He did it because he loves us. And he loved us long before we were ever thinking about him or noticing him. And it's so out of the ordinary what Jesus has done and what we celebrate here on Easter Sunday that you'd think it would be impossible to miss. And yet some of us still haven't confessed his lordship in our lives. Some of us keep moving around him, talking about him, serving him. But we have not made him God of every part of our lives. We don't stay near to him through scripture, through study, through his body, the church. Some of us have gladly soaked up his mercy for me. But we failed yet to share it with people who need to know the people that he's placed in our lives because they need to know. He's here. He's waiting. He's loving. He's inviting. And yet some of us, are, our eyes are clouded. And the heartbreaking reality is that for when we fail to see him, listen, we only ever experience the form of our faith and not the actual reality. We only experience death and all the things that come with that instead of actual victory in this world. There are people who are living the same world as you, carrying the same wounds as you, who have been broken and beaten down just like you, but they know victory today because they've seen Jesus. Would you like to see him today? Do you see him? So wherever you are this morning, whoever you're with, I want to invite you to take a few minutes to pray today and ask these questions. Is there some area of my life where he's not yet on the throne? Is there some area of my life where I could not look at him and call him my dear Lord, my teacher? Is he Lord of your free time? Is he Lord of your household? Is he Lord of your attitudes? Is he the Lord of your language? Would you invite him to be so that your eyes could be open and you could see him today? In what way could you offer him your attention this week? In what way could you draw near to him and stay near to him? Could you engage in one of the disciplines we've been talking about on Sunday nights? There's some way you could connect with other people to stay near to him through others, even from a distance. And what about trust? Will you trust him with your job through all this? Will you trust him with your finances? Will you trust him for your health? Will you trust him for your nation, your marriage, your singleness, your witness? To trust him is to go. To trust him is to move in his name. To trust him is to take that step without seeing where you're landing. To see him is to see victory, and that is what Easter is about. Do you want to see him today? Do you want to see his victory? Will you take a few moments now and pray together as we sing.
weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant, cause I know how this story of all who are listening today who perhaps have not had a relationship with you who haven't even been looking for you 
and yet for whatever reason decided to listen, decided to seek. Lord, my prayer for each one is they would begin to see that in rebellion, in sin, in shame, and the things that we've tried to hide from everybody else, you have been with us. You have been with us in every moment, walking beside us, calling out to us, waiting on us. Or for everyone that we would see you as the one who knows exactly who we are, who knows our name, who loves us in spite of our failures, and who is calling us, inviting us to trust you. Lord, for every believer who is watching today, who's been worried, who's been full of fear, who's been so scared about how all these thing, things will end up and turn out, or perhaps all of us who, who do love you, but we've been missing you because we've been so worked up about what we can do for you, how we can serve the form of our faith without the reality. A risen Lord standing before us. Lord, open our eyes today that we might confess your name that we might give you lordship over every part of our lives. Lord, that we would stay near to you. When the world calls, that we would cling to you. Lord, give us the faith we need to experience you so that we have news to share. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for what you've done for me. In the name of Jesus, give me boldness to speak that truth wherever I find people. Lord, help us. We want to see victory today. Help the brokenhearted today. Help those who have hurting, been hurting who have been abandoned, who have been abused, who have been covered in shame because of our sin. We want to see victory today, Lord, and we trust you for that. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for meeting us here in these moments. We give you all the praise on this Easter Sunday. Amen. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us today on this holiest of days. I want to encourage you to come back and join us tonight. We're actually going to be talking about the discipline of confession. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share on that one. So hope you'll join us. Hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you and happy Easter.